Hi, welcome to part one of chapter five, Modern Portfolio Concepts. In this chapter, we're going to look at understanding portfolio objectives, understanding how to calculate portfolio return, standard deviation as a concept in measuring risk in a portfolio, discussing the concepts of correlation, diversification, international diversification, looking at describing the components of risk and how to measure risk. And the other learning goals we will move into in part two of this lecture, we're talking about beta, capital asset pricing model, uh, portfolio management, traditional and modern, and describing and talking about uh, portfolio betas and risk return trade-offs. Okay, so what is a portfolio? Basically, a portfolio is a collection of investments, whether it be stocks, bonds, real estates, gold, artwork, comic books. Um, it's just a group of assets. Now, a growth-oriented portfolio is, partic is just like it seems. You're putting together investments for growth of your investments. So we're looking for capital gains primarily in a growth-oriented oriented portfolio. An income-oriented portfolio, we're looking at for it to throw off income, such as bonds, municipal bonds, high dividend yielding stocks, things of this nature. Throw off not so much. We're not looking for a huge amount of capital gains. We're looking for mostly uh, a monthly income through dividends. Now, an efficient portfolio is one that gives us the highest return for the lowest amount of risk. And this requires a lot of searching, a lot of um, research and alternative investments, different types of investments, understanding investments, how they can fit together in the best combination for your portfolio. It's a lot of work, but um, and it's a, it's a constant amount of work. That's something that once you construct your portfolio, you're, you're just not done. You also have to adjust it and continue to monitor it as it moves forward in time. Uh, now, to calculate a return on our portfolio, we could use a simple weighted average calculation where we weight the percentage of each asset and multiply it by its rate of return and find the sum of these results to get a weighted um, average return for a portfolio. Now, a standard deviation, we, can, we know we learned last chapter how to calculate a standard deviation on a stock. Now we could calculate a standard deviation on a whole portfolio and calculate um, the portfolio standard deviation based on the individual uh, assets in the portfolio and the weights of the portfolio and the correlation to each other. So we can, we can evolve that standard deviation calculation to a whole, a whole portfolio in this chapter. Now, here's the basic formula for calculating return on a portfolio where we're going to take uh, a portion of the total dollar value of one asset, or the first asset, and we're going to multiply it by the return. So it's the weight times the rate, and we add this. We keep repeating this for each asset uh, until done. And this will give us a weighted average cost of capital for our portfolio or a, a weighted return on the portfolio. So the, the actually the weighted average cost of capital is something we use in the finance class to figure out a uh, company's cost of capital. It's the same formula here, but when we apply it to a portfolio, we, we, it's basically a weighted average of the returns of the portfolio. Now correlation this is how we look at the relationship of assets within a portfolio. So the correlation is a statistical measure uh, that looks at a series of information between two assets. I mean, I could, I'm going to restate that. It looks at the movement in terms of stock price of one asset to another. So if two assets are positively correlated, they're going to move in the same direction. If two assets are negatively correlated, they're going to move in different directions. Just like um, figure out when you, you take uh, the different poles of a magnet, if you know either they stick or, or they move apart. The uh, correlation coefficient is a measure from negative 1 to 1 that will measure the degree of correlation between uh, any series of numbers. So if two things are perfectly correlated, you know, your stock A moves up 10%, stock B moves up 10%, and this is a continuous um, 
movement pattern, they would be perfectly correlated and have a co coefficient of 1. If, they're, if they were moving directly in opposite directions, went up 10%, stock A, stock B went down 10%, they, their correlation coefficient would be a negative 1. And if the two assets are completely unrelated, they would have a coefficient of 0. Here's a graphic de depiction of uh, one perfectly positively correlated, where they move directly identically, and uh, perfectly negatively correlated when they move in opposite directions. All right. So building a, a, a portfolio that's diversified will help generate a, a, cor a correlation of coefficient that will help reduce risk. So we want a a portfolio that's less than perfectly positively correlated to offset the risks of the movements of the other stocks within the portfolio overall reducing risk. So you know assets with a positive correlation eliminate no risk. So if everything has the same correlation it's just really like buying 10,000 shares of one stock rather than 10,000 shares of five stocks if they're all perfectly correlated. Um, now, if it's less than one, your group of stocks in your portfolio, then the correlation is going to reduce risk. Now, if it's perfectly negatively correlated, it will reduce all risk. So a negative one correlation for a portfolio has all risk reduced. And this would be sort of like um, buying an ETF, exchange traded fund, for the S that represents the S&P 500. And at the same time, uh, shorting that very ETF uh, that would be a perfectly negative portfolio and there would be no return. So one stock would, would make you $1,000, the other stock would lose $1,000. Okay, so if we combine negatively correlated assets to diversify risk, we can have you know two risky assets here, F and G, but together they reduce the risk because when F is going down, G is going up, so together they'll re reduce the overall risk of your portfolio, and that's sort of what we're looking for. Um, and, you, and you could see that if we have two stocks that might have two different uh, portfolio risk levels, IBM being safer um, and Celgene being riskier, you could see that the portfolio return um, will create this sort of sort of uh, if we look at the return over here and we have the, the portfolio risk over here and you can see sort of like an efficient frontier between these two stocks. Uh, now if you had both these stocks in your portfolio uh, it's going to lower as you get uh, have more IBM and less sell gen, you're going to lower your portfolio's return, but you're also going to lower your risk. So it's just kind of graphically depicting these two, the relationship of these two stocks. Um, here's another graphic representation of risk and return in combination of two assets. So high risk and, and, and high return you know, would be um, one aspect of two assets and lower risk and lower return would be another as aspect. So if you had all, say for example, you've had all IBM, you would have a lower risk and lower return. And if you had all of the uh, cell gene stock, you would have higher risk and higher return. But add the two together and uh, you're going to have, you can, you can sort of average the two together. I mean, it's common sense. Now international Diversification is also very useful because you know you can have situations in other countries that have better returns than the U.S. Um, you have different economic cycles in different countries, and they move in, in different. They don't always move in tandem with the U.S. And foreign markets may not be as efficient as the U.S. market, allowing for gains from better research. So the US market, everybody's looking at every stock all the time and things are pretty uh, well represented and, and, and fairly efficiently traded. But in other world markets, there may not be as much buying and selling. So it could lead f for more uh, trading opportunities, finding stocks that are not as yet as valued as highly as they should be because there just isn't enough trading in those markets. 
So, you know, if you have international diversification, you have a lot more investments to choose from and you have a potential for greater risks. Most, most of the time, the U.S. is not the number one performing market in the world. It's some other market. So that's why it's encouraging to include these other markets in your portfolio. And it helps reduce the overall portfolio risk when you include international stocks. Now, some disadvantages of international diversification is the currency exchange risk. If the currency, your stock in a foreign country may do well, but if the currency devalues, then you may wind up with a loss even though the stock price went up. And generally it can be less convenient to invest uh, to invest in other than the U.S. stock market because of ex exchanging currencies or accessing foreign stock markets at higher commissions. And of course, you know, it's generally looked at in most of these foreign markets as being riskier. Now, um, a lot of foreign uh, representation do, does take place in the U.S. stock market. There are many stocks that trade, um, international stocks that trade on the U.S. stock market. I'm at the um, New York Stock Exchange uh, website, and I'm looking at, you can see here, here are all the Canadian stocks. There's about 70 or so of them that trade on the New York Stock Exchange. And how they do it is they use something called, in some cases, they use American Depository Shares, ADSs, to homogenize, convert into U.S. dollars, and meet the and New York Stock Exchange requirements and list on the New York Stock Exchange. And um, you can also, here I have the European stocks. Um, and some of these are probably uh, Nokia trades on the New York Stock Exchange. We all know that stock. Um, SAP. Siemens, uh, there's quite a number of them. I have like nine pages. So there's literally hundreds of stocks from uh, international countries that trade on the New York Stock Exchange as if they were New York stocks. And there's a number of companies that you might even think are U.S. companies, but they're uh, international companies and they trade on U.S. stock market. Okay. Uh, mutual funds also invest in foreign stocks. You could buy mutual funds that are specifically based on any country in the world, any region. They slice and dice them pretty much any way possible. And buying U.S. multinational companies, even companies like Starbucks, uh, McDonald's, Burger King, uh, Yum Brands, which represents Taco Bell and KFC, they have their franchises all over the world, and they pull in a, a significant amount of their sales internationally. So they are they are by themselves the U.S. stock, but they're internationally diversified because the majority of their business is overseas. Okay, so let's switch over to talk about risk. So there are two components of risk. Uh, you have your diversifiable, which is also called unsystematic risk and you have your non-diversifiable which is called your systematic risk. So your, diver your diversifiable risk is risk that you can you can um, diversify away from. So this can result in you know uncontrollable or random events that are very sperm uh, uh, firm specific. You know so you could have an earthquake, a tsunami, a tornado, just hit one company and wipe out one company, but it doesn't affect the other companies in the industry. So you can diversify away from this risk by buying more companies. Um, so labor strikes, loss, lawsuits, different things that would just really affect one company by itself, you can diversify away from quite easily by having more companies. Now, non-diversifiable risk, or sometimes called systematic risk, these are forces that are going to affect all investments. So if there's, um, if there is a market downturn, market risk uh, will affect all stocks. You can't, you know, diversify away from it. Um, there, if there's inflation, if there's um, you know, um, a tax issue, I mean, this is something that will... Uh, if there's war, if Russia inv invades uh, Ukraine, if there's political events, these are things that you can't diversify away from. All stocks will sort of have a bummer day and go down, and it doesn't matter how many stocks you own, everything will go down. So there are, you know, usually bad economic news is a non-diversifiable. Unemployment rates and things come out, and you just can't, owning more stocks just doesn't help, and that's why it's called non-diversifiable. 
So total risk is together the non-diversifiable and the uh, diversifiable risk together. And that's your total risk. So it's funny how over here it says non-diversifiable and then over here it says undiversifiable. But you get the point. Um, so beta, this is something that we're going to cover in part two of this lecture and we'll talk about beta and how we can use beta as a measure of risk in the next part of this series. Please like and subscribe.